Welcome to everyone here tonight. We're going to start the meeting with an acknowledgement of country. The SES acknowledges traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise the continuing connection to land, waters and communities. We acknowledge the First Peoples of the River Murray areas as custodians of the regions and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living River Murray people today. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to Elders past and present. Before we start, I think most of you are locals, but the toilets are back in the corners and emergency exit in case we need to exit. So the SES, the South Australian State Emergency Service, is a volunteer-based emergency organisation and rescue service. We provide emergency assistance to the people of South Australia 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We respond to, to thousands of calls for assistance from the South Australian community each year. We respond to extreme weather events such as floods, storms and heat waves, road crashes, marine swift water, vertical and confined space rescues. We often assist other agencies such as South Australian Police and the Country Fire Service. Today we have about 1,600 volunteers based in 73 units across South Australia. Our volunteers are supported by a team of full-time staff. My name's Fiona Madigan and I have Mel Crossing at the back. We're both with the SES. We've got a number of speakers here tonight and we'll be going through them shortly. But first of all, I'd like to thank the people who helped to put the night together, including the council. This is an information meeting, so you're going to hear lots of information and most of it's on fact sheets. So we have some fact sheets back on the tables here. We have some more sheets at the back and we have more here. That's a bit different in all spots, so please have a look and take as many fact sheets as you need if you want to take family or friends who can't make it. Tonight our event's being live streamed, so there will be people online. So if you, if you have some questions at the end, we'll ask you to hold your questions at the end and we'll answer them and then. And if you do have some questions, you can put them on the post-it notes if you like, or at the end we'll answer those questions. So the guest speakers we have tonight, we have um, someone from the State Emergency Service, we have Robert, we have Ju, we have Joe, we have Ben from the Council, we have Tony from DIT, and I'm doing some acronyms here, so DIT is um, Department of Infrastructure and Transport, and we have Persa, who is Barbara Ann, from Primary Industries and Regions of South Australia. Housing SA is an apology bit, we have some information from them. SA Power Networks, we have Paul, and SA Water is unable to be here, so we have some information from them. So, as I mentioned, we'll start with the speakers first. Hold your questions, and we'll open the floor for questions at the end. And there is some post-it notes if you want some questions. We may not be able to answer all your questions tonight. We'll do our best. If you can't, you can put them on the post-it notes, and we'll send them back to the agencies for questions. There's a website which is sa.gov.au and that has a link on it to all the agencies. So as the agencies are updating information, it's going onto that website. So I'd urge you to have a look at that. It's a very good website. Um, I think that's probably the end of my introduction, but I might start with the SES. So I'll start with you, Robert. Thanks, Fiona. Um, so my name's Robert Charlton, I'm the current incident controller for the um, incident management team that's looking after the, uh, the River Murray flooding. Um, so we're based in Loxton and, and have been running there for uh, quite a few months uh, now. So I just want to sort of go through a few things um, and obviously there will be some of the things that I talk about will be built on more with the, uh, the various speakers. Um, but just wanted to talk about current situation. As obviously you're aware, there's a, a number of impacts already occurring. Um, certainly, uh, we uh, we look at the the flow that's currently at the border, and it's um, you know the model is that we'll see that uh, approaching um, here at Blanchetown towards the end of December. Um, there, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about flow and so forth because it's not my area of expertise. Um, but I know there's already been a number of impacts right across. Um, the River Murray, we've, we've seen a num about 1,100 properties impacted, there's about 90 road closures in place, um, and we're sort of seeing the highest uh, levels since uh, the 1970s um, there. Now, some of you would have been around and you've seen that. I wasn't personally um, to experience that, but there are others that may not have. 
but even though we, we, we've often talked about it's the same as 74 or it's similar to that, we know that the, the, the river has changed, so the, the channel has changed, you know, there's, there's other levees, there's other things that are impacting that, so it doesn't mean that it's going to get, for those of you who saw it previously, that it'll be exactly the same. Um, it could be more, it could be less, and it will vary in different places um, there. We, there's quite a few road closures around this area and, and you know, I, you probably know it a lot better than I do, but we know there's, uh, the shacks areas have been um, closed off. Um, the, uh, some of the areas like the Blanchetown Cemetery and Shooting Club are being monitored by the council, but Sunset Boulevard's completely closed. Um, Sanders Street section between Ackland Street and South Terrace is closed. Um, and you know, there's quite a few impacts already uh, there. So I guess, Talking a bit about what the SES is doing at the moment, as I mentioned, we have an incident management team based at Loxton, um, which is working seven days a week, also supported by our state control centre, um, which is also working seven days a week. So we, we started that incident management team um, in August um, because we knew things were coming, and obviously as the, uh, the forecast has changed and the risk has increased and we're now starting to see some of these impacts, we've increased our level of resourcing and, and the time that we spend there. Um, but we're well supported by lots of other agencies, and you can see um, some of them here tonight. So we work very closely with uh, local government, it's probably one of the strong ones, um, environment and water, uh, police, um, but a range of different stakeholders that support us so that we can help you. Um, and that's about making sure we, we pick up any of the issues that need to be planned for and we deal with things um, as we go along. So we've got, um, and again, some of these may not necessarily be so big an issue for this area, uh, but just working through. So we've got uh, levy working groups that have been um, technical experts and dealing with what needs to happen with those. We've got swift water resources. Um, that can actually go and deal with marine. I mean, you have a, a local SES unit here which does have a marine capability, but we're augmenting that right across um, the River Murray to uh, ensure that we've got everything that we need there. Um, you would have seen there's a lot of marine safety messaging, and you'll probably hear a little bit more about that um, there. Um, we've been identifying um, areas where we can actually use defence cells, so it's a specialised um, product, a um, little bit more than a sandbag, but it's a temporary levy, so we've been putting those across the area. Um, you may have received an emergency alert text message a few weeks ago, and you may have had somebody um, visit properties. Um, we, uh, along with the other emergency services, we uh, door knocked uh, over 5,000 properties um, right across the river, just to try and ascertain, make sure that people had the information, um, but also try and ascertain where the impacts were already happening. So out of that, we, we saw about uh, 1,100 properties that were already impacted, and I think it was about another 1,700 that were likely to be impacted um, just out of those. So it's not necessarily every single property, um, but the ones that were in the area of the, uh, of the warning. And uh, we just wanted to get an idea about what people's intentions were, where people were planning to, to leave or to stay. Um, and we've already, even in the last week or so, we've been able to use some of that information when we've seen some impacts. So we have seen a few levies fail um, in certain areas and we've been able to go back to that data and go, okay, is there anybody at that property? Are they planning to stay? Are they leaving? What's their contact detail? So only, we only had one this morning, um, not in this area, but where we were able to actually go straight there, get the contact details of people that were in the area, ring them straight away so they've got the latest information. Um, so I guess that sort of moves on to uh, alerts and warnings. So you may be aware that we do have current warnings uh, for uh, moderate flow. So uh, watch and act message, again, which has been out for some time right across the, the Murray. So that's on our SES website, or as Fiona said, you can go to sa.gov.au and then you'll find a link through to there. Um, we have also issued a few other um, messages where we've seen particular breaches or particular risks, so we will do that. If there is a, uh, an area of concern, we'll, we'll issue a more targeted message. Um, so I encourage you to just familiarise yourself with those uh, warnings um, there. But there's a lot of information, as um, Fiona said, that you can get off of those brochures and off of those websites. Sandbag locations, so we know um, that a lot of people have picked up sandbags so that they can try and do something to protect their properties um, and try and minimise uh, the damage. We know in some areas, particularly in the shacks, there you can't stop the water, so all you can do is, is clear everything out and, and try and minimise any further damage that way. Um, so, but we do have sandbag sites, six locations, um, including uh, one here at uh, Blanchetown. 
Uh, and so they're open seven days a week from nine until three. Um, and you can come along there, grab some sandbags, but also get some information, talk to the people there about um, what you need um, to um, try and deal with your property. And again, I know there's some brochures there about sandbagging and again, available on our website. So I guess, what can you do to try and um, keep yourself safe? Because that's really what we're here all about, is to help you stay safe, try and minimise any damage to your property. But we know that there are some things that we just can't stop. We can't stop the river. Um, so it is going to flood. You know, there will be damage. As we said, we've already seen over a thousand properties that have been impacted, and we know some of those are in this area. Um, but just be aware of what the risk is, so you can have a look uh, again through those web links and look at some of the mapping that's available there to try and understand what your risk is in your area. Again, understanding their models. Um, we've got actually got um, some of it up on the, the TV screen there. Um, and that'll give you a bit of an idea about whether you need to be concerned and, and, and what actions you can take. Um, but sandbagging, doors, vents, um, drains, even putting one in the toilet um, so the water doesn't come up and come out through that way, um, and it, lifting any objects off the ground. Um, and then once you start to looking at going on the water, just you know, really take heed a lot of the safety messaging that Department of Infrastructure and Transport are putting out. Um, we know there's some restrictions, and again, that's all about safety. Um, there's a lot of submerged objects in the water. You know, we've got that increased uh, flow rates. You know, you just don't know what's underneath, you don't know what you can't see. So really stick within your skill set and, and just be safe there. If you are using generators, because um, again we know that uh, in some cases um, that's a necessity, um, just make sure that uh, it's not in an enclosed space, that windows are open and so forth. Um, one very important thing to think about um, as things, uh, the impacts start to increase, um, is you need to decide what you're going to do. If, if your property is at risk and you've identified that and, and you, know, you haven't seen any impacts as yet, um, just think about what are you going to do. Are you going to actually stay uh, and you know, how are you going to prepare your home or are you going to leave? And it may not necessarily be that your home is going to be impacted. It might be that um, you know, the roads may be impacted, that services are impacted, and that might cause you to not be able to stay where you are even though your house is quite okay. So we are already seeing that in some areas where people have had to leave early because they've lost services, they've lost access, um, the ability to get food, medication, and some of those things. Um, so that's an important consideration as well um, for there. Because again, it's all about making sure that you're okay and making sure that you're safe, which is, I guess, what we're all here for. Um, if you are leaving, think about how long you're going to be gone for. Um, we know that this is, uh, it's taken us many months for the water to come up. You've, you've, you've all heard the messages, I'm sure. Um, it's going to take some time for the water to go down again as well. It's not a, it's not a short term thing, you know. Normally as emergency services we'll often come up and say, talk about, you know, particularly from the SES we talk about severe weather and we'll say, you know, there might be a, a storm on the weekend but not necessarily being able to tell you exactly where. Whereas here with a reasonable certainty, it's not 100%, we can tell you where it's going to be and we can tell you that it's actually going to happen and it's going to be for a long period of time. So that's, that's something that's a little bit different. We've got some time to prepare. That time is reducing rapidly um, as the, uh, the waters increase and we see the, the, uh, the higher flows um, coming through very soon. Um, but yeah, really consider about what, you, what your options are, what are you going to do, and if you are going to leave, where are you going to go? You know, and communicate that with your family and friends. Think about your neighbours as well. You know, so again, as Fiona said before, you know, if you want to take brochures home for, for neighbours or friends or family that couldn't get here, um, please do that. Um, and again, there's a lot of information on there. Um, a lot of safety messages that we want to get across as well. So monitor road closures. Again, um, you'll see information on the, the, the website. I'm sure council's got information on their um, social media and websites as well about that. So just make sure you're aware of anything like that. And in some cases, where possible, they'll put information out about planned road closures um, and so that you can keep up to date with that. We always talk about never walk, drive or play in floodwaters. Again, you just don't know the depth, you don't know what's underneath, you don't know what you can't see. Um, I'm sure you'll hear about uh, power lines and safety and so forth there. Consider um, any um, you know, drinking water and so forth there. I'm sure many of you have been through this before and I don't need to tell you that, but again, for those that haven't, just think about all of that, those safety messages as well, because it's, it's very important. And I guess we, we also value our safety. 
So one of the reasons um, we keep our crew safe and we don't want to have to come and rescue you and put our lives at risk if it's not necessary. Obviously, we'll do whatever we can to keep people safe and to, to come in there if needed, um, but if we can actually minimise the risk to you, it also minimises the risk to us and our crews, um, which is really important too. Um, we've got uh, uh, some, again, you'll read it in the brochures there, there's some phone numbers you can call, there's an info line. Um, Obviously, if you need assistance, you can call 132500 um, for SES assistance, but if it's life-threatening, you can call 000, obviously, at any time. And uh, hopefully, um, yeah, stay safe and minimise the impacts to your properties as much as you can. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Next, we have Joe from Environment and Water. Thanks, Joe. Uh, thanks, Fiona. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jo Rex. I'm from the Department for Environment and Water. I, walk, I work in the water delivery team. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about a couple of things. Firstly, we'll talk about the flow forecast, um, what we've observed this week, um, and we'll touch on a little bit about black water, and then where you can find all the information that I've provided to you this evening. So, I can report with a deep sense of relief that thankfully um, we've had a second week of dry conditions um, that's been experienced across the Murray-Darling Basin. This has, happened, this has helped to settle catchment conditions. There is 25 to 50 mil of rainfall forecast um, to come over the top of the Murray catchment, but we don't anticipate at the moment that it will contribute to the peak flow when it arrives to South Australia. So today, our current conditions, so at the peak, we understand that it is now at Euston. Um, it's definitely making its way to South Australia. The flow of the border is around 180 gigalitres a day. Flow at Overland Corner is at 143 gigalitres a day. Flow at Lock 1, 125 gigalitres a day. And we expect this to increase to 140 gigalitres a day by next Friday. Our lake levels are sitting at uh, 0.83 metres AHD at Lake Alexandrina and at Lake Albert, 0 0.79. We are expecting that we will be able to manage the flows at the barrages and continue to push water out um, as the water arrives. Um, we expect that we'll be able to keep the levels um, below one metre. At the Murray Mouth, as a result of all the water that's been uh, pushed out, um, we're starting to see a good amount of scouring um, which provides us a greater ability to push out water um, through the barrages and the lower lakes when and if we need it. So now I'll talk to you about what we've, what we've observed this week. During the last week, we have observed a significant amount of flow is bypassing the river monitoring sites used for calculating the flow to South Australia. Flood waters have now spread across much of the floodplain near the border, with flow also coming through Anna branches and across floodplain areas that are normally dry. This situation has proven itself to be extremely challenging um, for us to be able to measure river flow and for our gauges. Flow going around river monitoring sites has also been observed at a number of other sites, both upstream of the border and within South Australia. The current observed flow and river level is also much higher than what has been previously gauged during field visits at many monitoring locations. Or it has been almost 50 years since field measurements were made at this flow. So we're talking about the 1974 flow. Consequently, we advise that these current flood levels, Murray River flow estimates, should be interpreted with a high degree of caution. For example, recent field gaugings at Wentworth demonstrated that the flow being reported for that site was being significantly overestimated, which is why flow reporting from this site has been suspended by the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. This has occurred at a number of gauges throughout the system, Monitoring sites are considered to be of higher of monitoring sites, which are considered to be of a higher reliability, are those at Wakul Junction and Euston. Noting that there may be still a small amount of error at these sites, given the very high flows. 
Changes to the river channel and floodplain which have occurred since the 1970s, for example, things such as new roads being built, levees, increased vegetation cover, um, other infrastructure, changes in the physical characteristics of the river, um, are also believed to be accounting for some of the local increases that we've observed in water levels compared to historic floods. And this also explains why, perhaps in an area where there was some inundation in 1974, there may not be now, or there may be more. Flow forecasts provided by the Department for Environment and Water, which are developed in consultation with the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, Bureau of Meteorology, and other upstream water management agencies, have been measured against total River Murray flow crossing the South Australian border. As flow and water levels have increased near the border in recent weeks, the difference between the forecast and calculated flow to South Australia has increased, which is now understood to be caused by an increasing amount of water bypassing the river, the river monitoring site and the topographic changes referred to previously. In demonstration of this, river levels at Ren, Renmark have now exceeded levels above, uh, exceeded levels observed during the 1974 flood despite the recorded flow to South Australia being approximately 20 gigalitres a day, less than what was recorded in 1974. Consequently, the daily calculated flow to South Australia is not considered to be a useful measure in relation to the forecast flow and water levels. At the moment, we have hydrographers which are currently visiting a number of sites to undertake field gaugings of flow and water level, and further advice will be provided once these investigations are complete. It's really important to remember though that the predicted peak flow and the water levels um, that we are forecasting, that we're expected to reach, are not affected at all by this discrepancy in, in the daily calculated flow to South Australia. Water levels near South Australian border are currently very similar to the 1974 levels and the total estimated flow will be about 180 gigalitres a day. So that's what we've seen today. It is forecast that the total flow at the South Australian border will reach a peak in the range of 190 to 220 gigalitres a day in the last week of December. So now, I just also very quickly want to talk to you about black water um, and where you can find this information. So the information that I've just provided is available on the website that um, has been mentioned previously, so the sa.gov.au website. Um, also, um, a lot of the information that I've just shared with you is available in our SA River Murray Flow Report, which is issued every Friday. It looks like this. If you'd like to be signed up, you can provide your email to me directly and I can automatically subscribe you so that you receive it every Friday. Um, and just briefly, I'd just like to talk to you about black water. Um, so we are aware that um, there have been some black water events upstream. Uh, I can confirm that today um, there are no black water events uh, detected in South Australia at the moment. Um, black water is, is something that occurs naturally when floods wash leaves, grass and organic material into the, into the off river banks and into floodplains. Um, it makes the water appear darker, looks like a bit of a, a black tea. Um, in some instances, it can be good for aquatic life, um, but when, there are, when, there is, um, when it's mixed with high temperatures, it starts to deoxygenate the water and cause things like fish kills. Um, so this is, this is known as hypoxic water, um, and it affects the quality of the water. Um, I think SA Water normally talk about black water and about their treatment of it, um, but as was mentioned before, they've got some pamphlets um, that have been provided which you'll be able to pick up um, on your way out. Um, and just the one last thing that I wanted to mention, so based on the fact that now we know that the flow is at Euston, um, in terms of our forecasts, um, our messaging is starting to change around low um, moderate and high probabilities. Um, because the water now has moved out of the Edward Wakul system and back into the River Murray, we're actually able to start refining our ranges and our forecast. So you won't be hearing any more 
um, low, moderate, high probability. Um, we'll be able to give a range, and as our forecast gets better and our information gets better, we'll be able to refine that as we get closer to the peak. Um, at this stage, water levels further downstream of Renmark appear to be broadly within the range that is expected, um, but these will continue to be monitored as the peak travels through um, a range of locations through the river. Um, and we have a site, um, if you're interested in looking up um, what levels, uh, what the levels are near you, um, we have a site, Water Connect, that site is also available. Um, there's a link on the sa.gov.au website where you can look up your location and if there's a gauging station there, the information with the flow for those particular days you're after. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Next we have Ben from the Mid-Murray Council. Thank you and uh, thank you all for coming along tonight. It's really important that you're informed so you can make um, good decisions. And it's really important that uh, you know, you're getting uh, accurate information from the agencies or sa.gov.au. Um, Council also has a dedicated website um, and a page with all of the local information um, that is relevant to the specific areas. Uh, we continue to work with the SES, who are the lead agency, um, and we've been doing that since September um, and with all the other relevant agencies that you can see here. So it's a really a collegiate and collaborative approach to make sure that we're preparing as best we can and uh, focusing on recovery um, with our state recovery coordinator who's here tonight. Um, as I said, although we are still focused on preparation, we, we need to make sure that we are considering recovery um, and Council's absolutely um, working through our recovery action plan and we'll work with the state government to make sure that we are prepared. This is not a flash flood as we, we can all appreciate, um, it's going to be around for a while um, and that recovery is really, really important to make sure that we're working with the community um, and the relevant agencies. Um, our sort of focus from a council perspective has been uh, risk assessment um, to make sure that we are looking at the right flood mitigation strategies with a focus on protecting and preserving um, assets and obviously the safety of people being paramount. And we can continue to do that. Uh, we've talked about swim systems. Um, we, uh, we've mapped and have uh, flood inundation mapping all the way up to 250 gigalitres, even though we're not, you know, some of that gigalitting, um, the heights have changed. Um, and so we've got every uh, uh, asset that we know and are aware of uh, mapped and we're making decisions based on the information that comes through the um, DEW and the other agencies. Uh, they uh, can be assets like swims um, and, for example, we'll uh, make a decision to shut that down uh, subject to inundation, but generally they've been um, dictated by power and so when power has to be cut from a safety perspective, um, then we've obviously had to uh, shut down the swim system, which has happened here in Blanchetown. Um, as a result of um, the power being turned off. Uh, road closures, uh, we have 3,000 kilometres of roads, um, which is the second most in the state. We're very lucky. Um, we're expecting about 250 kilometres to be impacted uh, by inundation. And I think we're about halfway there, or um, and Russell, who's here from the council, can confirm that after. Um, but obviously a number of roads, including the roads down um, by the river here in, in Blanchetown. Um, we uh, have a high river update uh, which we distribute weekly and actually at the moment we're distributing um, twice a week. That has all of our roads uh, mapped on it and all of the townships uh, and it has a colour code on it that says uh, basically red, green or orange uh, and the prediction of when that road may be impacted by the flood uh, mapping that we've done. So I encourage you if you haven't signed up um, or uh, aren't aware of that to make sure you do that because that is giving you notice of when we think it's going to happen. We can't give you a definitive date because the river is changing and moving so quickly, um, but at least gives you some notification uh, to make some decisions on what you will have access to. Um, as I said, you, um, information is the key, so please sign up to that. Uh, we've undertaken some temporary levy construction in Manham and Morgan. Um, they are nearly complete. Um, we did a review, as I said, of our assets and highlighted um, critical infrastructure um, and we've worked with um, the SES and uh, the other agencies to build those um, levies. Um, they have been constructed from a peer perspective. They have to be engineered, peer assessed and then signed off by SA Water um, and uh, department engineers. Um, so a lot of work goes into them. Uh, I will touch on, um, not my area of expertise, but uh, levies that have uh, happened around the place. It's really important that you 
are you using the right material and you're getting the right advice on it. Um, and, the, and the material is the key uh, because you know if you're just looking at using sand, then that can cause issues. And we've seen that upriver already, where some levees have failed. Um, so it's important to make sure. And also considering if you are doing that or sandbagging, um, the impact on your neighbours. Um, you might not just want to move the water somewhere else. So it's about being considerate and understanding what happens if you do build those structures. Um, and marine structures, the other thing that we've been monitoring and, and having to shut. Uh, we understand that, especially in some of the shack areas uh, here and uh, lower down the river and further up towards Morgan, um, they're going to be, uh, access is going to be cut if that hasn't already. Um, and so access will be by boats on occasions and people still want to be using their boats in, in through the boat ramps. Um, some of them have been shut already from a safety perspective. If you are doing it, then make sure you do it safely because you don't know what, is in a, uh, what submerged infrastructure is in place or around the place or what's floated down the river. Um, but we understand that people may want to use their boats to access their shacks um, or their uh, properties. Uh, but we may have to shut those uh, boat ramps um, and we can have individual conversations about other opportunities potentially to um, put your boats in. From a community perspective, we've already talked about the sandback sites, which are here at Blanchetown um, and uh, in other locations across our council area. Um, we've been working with uh, Housing SA on displaced residents. Um, we've put some temporary camping sites. They don't have facilities, and one is here. Um, not that anyone's currently using it. Uh, if people do want to stay close to their properties, um, they can stay there. And we've got information on caravan parks, unfortunately, as with uh, Blanchetown, a lot of the caravan parks are uh, up and down, are on the river, um, and they're going to be impacted and closed, um, whether that's for inundation or power or um, you know, others, uh, other reasons that they have to close. Um, from a development perspective, we've been asked a number of questions around uh, development, building those temporary flood mitigation um, levees or structures. Um, we have the ability under the planning laws to um, undertake works from an emergency perspective uh, if there's a risk to persons and, and buildings. So you can do that. What we encourage you to do is uh, give council a call, speak to our planners so you can understand what you can and can't do. Um, if it's deemed to be works, which is, I think it's over three metres, um, then you still do need to apply for a development application and go through that process, but you can do it retrospectively um, to enable you to do it. And I understand that you know, the river has moved quite significantly in the last few weeks, so some of that um, work has already been undertaken. Um, from a recovery perspective, uh, we, we understand, given the number of properties, I think it's 4,000 properties predicted to be inundated or uh, impacted over the, the flood event. Um, that there's going to be the need for works to occur uh, to repair or improve or fix. Um, and so we're streamlining our development application process to make sure it's as easy as possible um, and focused on those areas that uh, specifically need it because they've been impacted by the flood event. Um, so I encourage you to speak to council planners on what that looks like. Uh, from financial support, uh, the government is responsible for um, support packages, but what council can do and are, are considering is some support around a relief of what rates and also for service charges. We understand that um, you, uh, well, there's a number of services that we provide and you get charged that. For example, waste that may be impacted and council are considering what we can do in that space and the report will go to the December council meeting for consideration. Uh, the last point, or two points, sorry. Firstly, communications. As I mentioned, we've got a dedica dedicated web page. Please um, sign up to our High River Update. That's got a lot of local information that's really important for you to be informed and make good decisions. Um, you can do that via website or you can contact Council's office. Um, the Blanchetown office, which is open a couple of times a week, uh, is closed because the power's been switched off. Um, so we are still opening on a Thursday for an hour so library services can be done manually. Um, so we want to make sure we encourage that. We had some holiday uh, community um, programs for some of the kids. We're still looking to run them at a different location and we'll communicate that out as, uh, as soon as we can. And we're mindful that we want to continue to provide services where we can. Um, the last one is uh, waste services. So we've been working with our contractor solo around ferry closures, um, which obviously there's a bridge here which helps. Um, but up and down the river, so for example, the Morgan Ferry has gone out um, 
and the Swan Reach one, and Madam Upstream is already out, and Madam Downstream is going to go out on Sunday night, um, and we understand that is going to cause significant issues for the community. Um, so we've been working with our contractor. Um, their current thinking is they'll continue to uh, deliver all of the services that they do, um, subject to inundation and roads being closed. Um, so there may be a need to move your bin to a location that is accessible, um, and we'll co coordinate that with Solo and have communications with those communities impacted by that. Uh, one of their pieces of advice, if you are going to leave your property, then please secure your bin um, so it doesn't float down the river, whether that's with a cable tie or some manner of um, yeah, a, a securing it to the, the house or a fence. Um, but at this stage, as I said, we continue, or our operator, there's a nice little bug there on the microphone, um, trying to get to a high ground. Um, we, we still think that we're going to be able to provide all of our bin services other than road closures and inundation. So that's all from my perspective. Uh, Russell and I are here after to answer any questions specifically or in the Q&A. Um, but uh, yeah, stay safe and make sure you're getting the right information from the right sources. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Tony from Infrastructure, Transport and Primary Industries, and Primary Industries and Regions in South Australia. Hello. So my name's Tony Scarlett and I'm from um, the Department for Infrastructure and Transport and I'm based out at Murray Bridge. So I'm just giving you a brief overview of the impacts of this event to ferries, roads and marine safety today. Um, I have an information flyer on the tables, all of them, um, that give a bit of a um, list of the websites and phone numbers and stuff that I'll be um, saying in my presentation so you don't have to write anything down. Um, keep in mind that most of the flyers will, even though we're often saying about our website, um, we did hear you at the last meeting um, that there is a lot of people that have difficulty um, getting online um, in this area and getting onto websites. So most of the flyers also have phone numbers, so do keep that in mind. Um, so our department's been working with um, the SES since August, since the Innocent Management Centre was set up. Um, and we've been working really hard to do a lot of planning, um, including planning out road closure detours um, for roads that we um, anticipated to be impacted, um, particularly like the state roads that we look after. So we've got detour maps set up on our website that you can go and have a look at to know when certain roads that we've anticipated will close and what the detour route is anticipated to be. So you can plan ahead um, and look at those. Um, we already have closed a couple of roads, um, and not necessarily in this area, but Book Penong Road um, between Lockton and Berry, that's been closed now for uh, more than a week. Um, and Morgan Road near Barmara has been closed to protect um, works that the council's been doing there. Um, and we have closed uh, Kingston Road to heavy vehicles at this stage. Um, but that road is likely to be closed to all traffic um, in the coming week. Um, and we've got the detours all posted on our website. So there's also signage on all of the areas. Um, you might have already noticed um, our, you know, the VMS electronic sign boards at the side of the roads everywhere. Um, they're ours ready to switch on at an instant. Um, they can all be done remotely. So they're ready to go at a moment's notice. Um, we are trying to keep all the roads open as long as possible um, while still maintaining safety. Um, but we are also trying to make that really fine balance between giving everyone notice that the road is going to be closed, but also trying to keep it open as long as possible while maintaining safety for everyone. So it's been a very difficult task to do, um, but um, we're managing it so far. But there will be times where we have to close a road suddenly if the water comes up quickly or a road is damaged suddenly. Um, so we appreciate everyone's patience with that. Um, there's also um, going to be a closure um, near Wakery, um, that's the road that leads to the ferry, um, and that's going to make a bit of a wide detour off, to, but the ferry will remain open at this stage, but it will be a longer detour to get onto that ferry if anyone's heading that way. Um, that'll be um, happening in the next week as well. 
We're monitoring all of our roads for any uh, issues. Um, and we're working a lot with councils who are keeping an eye on everything for us as well. And we're um, watching the water coming up on the sides and watching out for whenever the roads might need work on them or if they need to be closed or detoured and are communicating that out through our website and our social media um, and giving as much notice as possible, like I said. All the current road closures, uh, including council roads, are all listed on the Traffic SA website. Um, we ask everyone to remember it's never safe to drive into floodwaters at any time, and if members of the public come across any dangers on the road, including floodwaters, they can be reported 24-7 to the Traffic Management Centre uh, on 1800 018 313. On to the ferries. We're watching them very closely, and our ferries team has done a wonderful job in tweaking the landings um, so that they can stay open as long as possible. Um, every single ferry has stayed open far longer than we thought they could because of the work that they've done. Um, but as um, Council said, that um, a lot of them have now closed. So Lirup, um, Morgan, Swanreach, um, and um, one of the uh, Madam Ferries has closed and the second one's closing to on Sunday night. Um, we we're also expecting the Pernong Ferry to be closed um, in the next week or so. Um, in some cases, ferries might close because the roads leading to them will become inundated because, as by necessity, the roads leading to a ferry are low. Um, and so they're often even lower than the landing to the ferry. So if they get inundated, we have to shut the ferry because it's just not safe. Um, and some of those will be things like um, down at Talonbend and um, Jervis. Um, yeah, so some of those ones down there, a Wellington uh, ferry, they may close because the road's inundated rather than the ferry actually being out. So the, some of the other um, ferries, um, like Cadell, um, Walker Flat, Narang, they're all still open at this stage, so um, no anticipation of them closing in the short term. Um, on to the marine safety. Some of you might have seen the vessel restrictions that we've put out, so um, that's been out since the 23rd of November, advising a four-knot speed limit around um, any um, uh, property partially or fully submerged. Um, so that four-knot speed limit is within 250 metres um, and also with any levy partially or fully submerged. Um, and that applies also to vehicles operating at night or in restricted visibility. Um, also, jet skis must not exceed four knots on any part of the, on the, of the river. Um, and there's also restrictions around locks and weirs. Um, uh, vessel operators on vessels 12 metres and under are required to ensure that all passengers on board wear a level 50 or above life jacket while underway and at anchor. Um, all these restrictions apply from the border all the way down to the ferry landings at Wellington. So our marine safety team have been working really hard to mark out all the hazards on the river, which you can imagine is an unending task as the water comes up because everything's getting submerged. Um, as Council said, there's, you know, um, all the um, boat ramps and the um, pontoons and jetties, everything's going underwater. Um, and our team have been trying to put yellow buoys on top of everything so people know what's underwater. Um, but almost every day something else goes under. So if anyone knows of anything that's underwater and is not marked, we do have a form online that people can fill in um, to, to report it so that our team can get out and do the marking. Uh, we have teams in the area all the time. Um, they're some of the people filling up the hotel rooms. Um, and so you can Google, and this is a web form unfortunately, but you can Google um, marine safety and it's the first search term that comes up. Um, and so you can report where that is and that it's unmarked and it's a hazard in the water and they'll get that team out there pronto. Um, so users on the water are asked to take extra care because there are some of those things that are not marked yet and they could be a real dan danger to anybody on the water. Um, there's also a 50 metre exclusion zone around electricity power lines standing in the River Murray. Um, don't ever assume that those power lines are not live uh, always assume they are live and dangerous 
um, and uh, vessels have to have a 50 metre exclusion zone around them at all times. Um, in general, we advise vessels to stay away from floodplain areas um, where possible um, so that they can keep away from those um, electricity power lines as far as possible. Um, so, in summary, we just ask the community to stay safe on our roads and our ferries and waterways. And if you see a danger on the road, call the Traffic Management Centre. And if there's a hazard in the water, report it on our website to the Marine Safety Team. And we know that the road closures and the ferry closures are inconvenient and it's disruptive. And our department's top priority is to keep everyone safe. I can assure you that we're doing everything we can to reopen everything as soon as it's safe to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Barbara Ann from Primary Industries and Regions SA. Hi, done this a few times now. Um, firstly, obviously I'm Barb Cowie, I work for Primary Industries and um, Regions and uh, my role is as Regional Coordinator for the Riverland and Murray Lands area. So this is my natural working space and um, yeah, I, I do live in region. Um, one of the things that I suppose I just want to reiterate is that PERSA is part of all of the state coordinated responses, so we are part of all of the different uh, groups that are put together and we also have our own internal uh, group that meets twice a week to make sure that we capture anything that's going on in all of our respective spaces. So if any of us hear anything, it feeds in and we, we, we do act on it. Um, we have a number of things which everybody would know about and would have heard about that are ongoing and in particular of, of significance for us is obviously fruit fly and we will continue to monitor our traps as best we can. Some are going to be quite difficult to get to and we'll also still continue to have our uh, fruit fly uh, responses uh, going on uh, just over the river. Um, the reality is we have 16 current outbreaks and uh, that is a, is a concern, especially when you consider we're going to have um, additional fruit that may not be able to be picked this year because of inundation. So um, please be mindful, and if you see people trying to get away with taking fruit upriver, stop them. Um, I don't know what else to say, really. Um, within a, in an emergency like flood, PERSA has responsibility for animals and we have um, a hotline that people can report any animal welfare issues, stranded animals or anything of the like. And uh, we have had reports already come in and it can happen quite quickly. So please, if you see anything, ring the hotline and... Um, we, we will respond and um, we have a relationship with RSPCA um, and Animal Welfare so they also get involved and if it's a, a cruelty or a, um, a, a, an animal welfare issue then um, obviously it's a, 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 the PERSA vets will, vet team will get involved too. Um, we have some fantastic services and one of them is our Farm and Business Mentor Program where we actually have three fab mentors. One's actually in the room right now, Robin. You're allowed to be really loud and bold. No. <laughs> and basically our Farm and Business Mentors are there for anybody to, who might uh, want to have a chat, find, you know, is overwhelmed with all the information coming at them, um, has some uh, com complex situation that they just uh, would like to talk through, these guys are there all the time. And they're approachable, all their details are um, on our website and can be accessed through sa.gov.au too. Um, we also have some primary industry grants that will be out there. Uh, we have an expression of interest up online at the moment um, and they're predominantly for the pumps component and power component. Um, while the guidelines haven't been released, if you do fill out an expression of interest, once they do come out, um, you'll get all of the information. Uh, we also are working with the Department of Small Business and of Fam Small and Family Business, who are actually uh, providing the generator grants, which are both for on-farm and for private dwellings that are going to have power cut off. So um, the uh, 
Office of um, Small and Family Business is also, uh, and they've asked me to just remind people that they also are the administrators for the small business grants. So if there are businesses that have had to cease operations because of the flood already, um, then they are there to provide some support as well. There's some little blue cards over on the, the table to take as well. Um, and in all relief centres, there will be a person from the uh, Office of um, Small and Family Business to help people fill those out as well. Um, we, have, we are part of the relief centres that are being established, and we do have someone who is based in both the current uh, Berry and Manham one. We also will have other people that come and go depending on what's needed. And um, if we feel that there's a need, we'll also um, arrange to have farm and business mentors come in and out as needed. So please go in, have a chat to whoever we've got on board and they'll um, be able to help you out. Um, Blackwater, my favourite topic. Okay, so while the department is is responsible for Blackwater and the, the water itself. And um, we uh, at Primary Industries are responsible for any fish cleanups that might happen from that hypoxic water. So if anyone notices any volumes of fish dying, please ring our Fish Watch number, the PERSA hotline, or the, use the Fish Watch app and that will trigger someone to have a look and it will also trigger the, um, the implementation of the cleanup. We've actually got the plans in place as to how that will occur. We're working with um, people who have facilities and, and capacity to do that, so we don't anticipate that there'll be too much of an issue in getting people on board to, to actually uh, do the cleanup. We understand that it's that obviously depends on the size and where, but um, it, we do have everything in place to do it. Um, one other thing with black water, and um, it's a bit of a challenge because the complexities of our water in the River Reach means that SA Water provides a lot of drinking water and um, household water to a lot of customers, but we also have a lot of people that are direct pumpers which means that they don't have access to that filtered water. Um, and also we have domestic, we have stock that is also um, part, is being, uh, the water is being used for. One of the things we, we want people to start thinking about is that stock, while there is no harm to the stock with the current black water that we're seeing, that, that just that uh, flowing chocolatey coloured water coming down, while there is no harm in them drinking it, they may not like it because of the organic matter. So there is, uh, it, it's worth, if you do have um, some stock, to start thinking about what you might put in place um, in that case. So it, there's a lot of complexities coming in and we're going to keep um, having to think about new things as the water moves through because we'll, be, we'll, we'll have different demands placed on us. But we are here and we are, we're there to try and help and, and work through all of these issues with everybody as, as they come up. So thank you. That's it for us. Thank you. The next speaker was Housing SA and they couldn't be here so they've sent their apologies but I have a short statement to read out. So the South Australian Housing Authority are the functional services activated in a disaster by the lead agency. In this case SES has have activated housing to perform the relief function. Relief pr provides physical, financial and emotional support to impacted people in a disaster. There's two centres currently open. One's in the Berry Senior Citizens Club, Crawford Terrace, and there's one in Manham at the Football Club. Both centres are open 9am to 9am 9 to 5pm, seven days a week. In the centre are not only housing staff, but there are also other participating agencies. So there's Red Cross for welcoming and psychosocial support, Centrelink for financial assistance, and that's particularly for those who cannot attend their workplace, DIIS for generator and small business grants, Disaster Ministries for Care and Support, Legal Services, PERSA for their grant and animal welfare. Relief staff all process, also process personal hardship grants, 
accommodation grants, both long, short, long term and short term, and rental assistance grants. The basic eligibility for these grants is on the sa.gov.a website or call the relief hotline and talk to someone about your eligibility or just pop into the financial or into the relief centre. The centre can assist people who have to leave their primary residence and have no other options with motel type accommodation. We'll try our best to place people near community but there's a lack of available accommodation so you may not be near your home. Even if you're not impacted by the flood at your home, please feel free to attend the centre or call the hotline to get access to psychosocial support, which can be by phone or in person. It's normal to feel stressed in these situations and good to talk to people, so please reach out. Now, the relief information, hot, information line is 1800 302 787. So the next speaker we had is for South Australian Power Networks, and that's Paul. Of course, you come to these meetings with lots of notes, but I'm really quite conscious that I'm, I think I'm the last speaker and I'm standing between us and watching the rest of the cricket. So I'll try and keep it short, but also I really want to pick up on a few things. I think we've heard the word safety used a bit, and it's been in a few of the talks, and our focus is fundamentally about safety for the community and property. So people are asking us, why are we disconnecting power? And it's very much because of that. It would be highly dangerous for us to continue to supply electricity to a person's home when that home is underwater. And if you can imagine where your power points are, they're all down here. So they're going to be under even a foot of water in your house, your power points are going to be under it. And what we want to do to protect you is turn off the power at the right time. And we also want to protect your property. It'll reduce the damage to your property and it'll also help reduce the damage to the electricity network. So when we come back to restore your power, we can do it quicker. So that's the sort of fundamental core thing is we actually want to save lives that, and that's why we're disconnecting power. Um, and the water is rising very quickly. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, I think we've all probably seen that as we travel up to the river uh, and you who live here would have seen that. It is rising rapidly and it's not r rising in a consistent way, which I think Joe was, was explaining. So that means that we're approaching these disconnections in, in a, in a a quite organised way. So we see the, um, we have the flood modelling. So we have a, use the modelling and overlay that onto our electricity network or the other way around as the case may be and identify the areas that are going to be flooded at certain levels. But what we're doing is we're not turning off from a distance. We're actually sending crews and we've actually quadrupled our people in, in the Riverland to do this and in, the, in, the, in these reaches to actually go to site and look. And so they're going to site, and in some cases that means more people than we expect are being disconnected. If we find places already underwater or just about to be inundated or infrastructure such as on a number of stovey poles, you'll see lines going down the side in a plastic casing, for example, or a black casing down under the ground. Well, those go into service pits underneath the ground and if they get wet and they're still, uh, electricity is still being supplied to them, that is a really dangerous spot to be in. But we also, like this week, so we've disconnected 1,800 customers, but those 1,800 customers would include, I think, the 1,100 properties of homes, shacks, etc., but also pump sheds, shed, uh, other sorts of sheds, uh, even the councils, uh, if they've got electric barbie on the waterfront, that's what we would call a customer. So there's a variety of, variety of uh, points that have, service points that have been disconnected. But what we found through our experience also is people have been saying, why haven't you notified us? So we've been reviewing that and we're, we're, going to, we're changing the way we notify. So what we've been trying to do is actually be really granular and say that you and you and you are going to have your electricity, uh, we're going to come to review your electricity and you may be disconnected. But you are supplied with all the other people here by a transformer which may be just up the line a little bit but when we get to site, we realise we're actually going to have to disconnect at the transformer level. So we haven't notified you, but we've notified you. And that's happened in, in some circumstances. So what we've decided to do is we're going to notify to the transformer level. And that will mean that at least you'll know that we're coming to, to make a, a decision about disconnection. And you may, may not be disconnected, but you may. But you've got that longer warning that we're trying to give of about seven days. Although I emphasise to people, this is an emergency situation. 
and emergency disconnections happen, could happen at any time, depending on what the river is doing and what we find. And we don't always know what we're going to find. The modelling doesn't necessarily tell us all that. Um, there was a couple of things that were mentioned. Um, ben mentioned uh, the private levies. Uh, we have gone to a couple of places and seen private levies that have been built very close. So someone has been very close to the power lines. You need to take power lines into account. When we talk about uh, electric shock, you don't just get an electric shock by touching a line. Some of these lines and these lines out here are 11,000 volts. If you get within a certain distance, the electricity can jump. And in wet conditions as well, there's a real risk. So don't build a levee right under a power line. Be very aware of, of the height from the power line and the safety of that. It's not a safe thing to do. Um, we continue to uh, look at um, what we can do for you. So one of the things we've, we've done is we're going to be advising retailers that you've been disconnected. And hopefully the retailers uh, won't give you a nasty surprise by giving you an estimated bill when you haven't actually been using power. So we're, we're notifying all the retailers. We're working with um, some of the local businesses to um, relocate some of their infrastructure. It's challenging though, because people will have a pump on the water's edge and it may be a long way to where they want electricity otherwise, it's very difficult to uh, compromise. We, can't, we need to disconnect that pump shed, but we've been working where we can with customers to relocate some of the service points to a, to a safer level. Um, we've also uh, got an SMS system, which I really want to encourage you to take up. And there's a sheet down there with a couple of different QR codes and websites so you can you can link into our SMS updates, which will go to your phone or an email if you want to enter that into it. There's safety advice on our website uh, and what you can do to prepare your property, which the key thing is disconnect your power before the water hits your property. Don't wait to be flooded to disconnect. It's not safe for you and it's also going to mean you're going to get a lot more damage. Um, switch off and unplug your appliances. Try and move everything up as far as you can. I'm sure you're all probably thinking about that if you are in, in threat of being flooded. Turn off the main electrical switch at the switchboard and if you've got solar panels, get your electrician to come and go on the roof and, turn, and isolate on the roof. Because if you don't and you isolate on the wall, you've still got a fairly low point which is going to be supplied by your panels. So get an electrician to do it, it's a skilled job, but it's, a, it's an important job to protect your panels and your, again, your own uh, electrical wiring. Uh, don't stay in a house if it is flooded and the electricity is still on. Get out and give us a call as an emergency on 13 13 66. Uh, my, one of our general managers continually talks about his fear about people using hair dryers while standing in a foot of water. Don't, don't be in the house and don't be using electricity. Um, the other thing that was mentioned was the exclusion zone. Uh, that's actually going to be really important in helping keep more people connected to power. So we've got a lot of power lines which actually cross the river and or cross floodplains. And what we're seeing at the moment is in some places, I was looking at some pictures just yesterday of a place where we've got tall poles, not these ones, taller poles, and the water's two thirds of the way up. And we're, gonna, we're disconnecting that, but we've got another way of supplying that, that area. But the challenge for us, we don't have that everywhere. So. We've got radial lines, so if you imagine the lines come out from a substation, they spread to people and they spread, but it's a, it's a radial network. So we don't have options to bring it in from somewhere else in all places. We do in the city, but not here, not in the regional areas, and so that's a challenge too in keeping supply on, for example, for people who may be supplied by lines going across a floodplain, but they're out of reach of the water. And you've got that here. There's a line, I think, that goes across down this way, across to the other side, which is supplying the other side, and we don't have an alternative supply to them. So it's really important, like that exclusion zone, if boats don't go near and we're confident about that and the government's confident about it, we can keep that line on because we can say that we're, we're observing the, the safe clearances. Um, any electricity infrastructure in standing in water stay absolutely as far away from it as possible because it may be live, it's really important to do that, the, the rule of thumb, just stay away from it. Uh, I wouldn't be boating in floodplains where there's electricity lines. Those lines are probably live in most cases and there is a risk. 
Um, in closing, look, uh, it's been great to get some feedback actually from people through these, these meetings and uh, I do the radio interviews and we got some feedback from some people at Bowhill who weren't notified. It's, it's made, you know, and we're in a learning process. I wasn't around when the last flood was, well, I was around, but I was pretty young and I wasn't working in power when the 74 floods came through. And we're learning as we go. Like everybody, we're, we're learning, for example, that the water isn't doing what it did previously. We need to change some of what we're doing, and if we if we can, and we hear of the issues that maybe are affecting you, we're very happy to change or look at how we might be able to change practices to keep you informed. And the final point is, I know it's incredibly hard now with water coming up to doors and going through properties, but I think the the recovery is going to be harder. It's going to be an extended period where we won't have power, and then when we come to recover, it's a bit like, we're thinking it would be like how we respond to a bushfire. And that means door to door, working with people to reconnect. If a property has been flooded, we will want to, we will want to see your electrician give us a certificate of compliance to say it is actually safe for us to reconnect your house or your pump. If it's been affected by water, it would be remiss of us not to get that clearance and that confirmation that it's safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, SA Water apologises that they were unable to send a spokesperson to attend this forum, but please be assured that they have crews on the ground working to maintain normal water and wastewater services where possible and protect waste and wastewater infrastructure to prevent or reduce damage in the longer term. There's currently no impact to the drinking water supply or quality for any SA Water Riverland or Murraylands customers with the utilities water treatment plants designed to manage a range of source water quality challenges. SA Water is asking people to register their mobile number to be kept informed of important and timely notifications on how the River Murray flood could impact water and wastewater services in the area. So to update your contact details to receive these SMS messages, it's go to sawater.com.au. That brings us to the last of the speakers. I'm going to open the floor now for about 15 minutes if anyone's got any questions. So if you could, could you put up your hand and could you stand up please? And Mel will bring the um, microphone down. Thank you. It's All right, first thing, we'll start with the last bloke. It's a SA Power Network, anyway, same thing. Turn the power off on the river, three days, when it was dead dry, they turned the power off. Then came back, or oh, hold on, they turned the power off, then the shelter in the back, still on the oval, and the power box in the oval, which had water all the way around and up, was still alive. So when we complained, they said, oh, we don't have enough services to do it, so we had to do it now. A blanket, shut out. 60 minutes warning. We were a lucky one, we got 60 minutes. Three days later, they came back and did, disconnected something else. Went to the exactly same box, did the same. Six cars and a truck. But you haven't got enough people to do it. You only got enough power to do it once. We brought in more resources, as I said, we got four times the resources we normally have in the river. Yeah. Uh, look, it's not, it's not perfect. I oh, know, I know it's not perfect, yeah. And, and you know, we're we are trying to respond to those concerns. It's, the lady down the street was doing a washing. She had eight minutes to go on the cycle, and you went, turn the power off. <laughs> what did, and she said, what do you do with the washing now? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was saying about when we're yeah. trying to improve the uh, notification. It, yeah. won't, it won't be able to say specifically what time you've lost your power. We had basically, we were lucky, we had 60 minutes of warning. Some of them only got 30 minutes and 20 minutes. And, you know, that was a big thing up and down the street for conversation there. They had the bloody Premier and everything out there about it. Right, who was the next one? Da -da 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 -da. Oh, I haven't finished yet, I've got one for each, each person here. Oh, okay. All right, we'll start with these two. Levy banks. Is it true that every levy bank you build increases the water height here? Because you're not allowing the water to flow out into the, the wetlands. You're blocking it off. 
So it's got to increase the water level here, height. Look, I'm, I'm not a hydrologist or an engineer, but I guess, you know, logically that makes sense logically that there would be an sense. impact. Um, as to how much that would be, it, it'll vary. But yeah, so I went you past, are pushing the water down the yeah, channel further. I went mm. down past Lake Bonnie today and you can see out the back, it's all, all dry, you know, where it normally... But they're building the walls so they don't need more water in it. Where water would have normally flowed out there, but they're building the wall to stop it. Which means that excess water's got to come down here. And so as it goes down... So it's got to have an go impact on here. For sure. Yeah. Yep. That was that question there. Then we've got one for the council. You said that this here was the emergency. People could park the caravans here. Am I right? This is uh, being set up. For if you time. ring the council chambers, they'll tell you to go out there in the bush. Not anymore. It's changed. When, when did it change? Uh, about a week ago. No. And we I don't think it will. No. I was worried about the elderly people. I was from the caravan park in Paisley. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so what happened was I phoned Mid Murray because there's several guys that have nowhere to go. So I rang him and said, obviously, with all the caravan parks now that are being closed down, is somebody going to set something up for these people where someone can at least go get a cup of tea or a coffee? Yeah. I even asked about a washing machine, maybe someone's got a disability, maybe, I don't know, they need to do clothes washing because they can't drive to Wakery. I said, is it? She said, I'll, I'll write it down and documentate it, but as far as I know, no, nothing's been said. That was yesterday, I rang the Murray Council. But, sorry, just to clarify, you've asked two different questions there. So we've got a set up here for people who come with their caravans or tents. So there's no services being offered. But yeah. to be We've been told that it's so offensive for the school to have people here correct. and, you know, like, out in the bush. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, the side has been set up here and that fence mm. was put up um, last uh, Monday. Ah, uh, that's what the fence is for, is it? Correct, yeah. No, no so worries. Can I just, just clarify, so the education yeah. department um, wouldn't allow us to uh, put the displaced residents here yeah. because of the risks associated. We worked with them really proactively and that's why the fence went up. And so ability uh, is for that piece there. Right. We're not providing services because we don't have ability yeah. to No, contact. let's fix that. No, 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 we need a place for someone to stay. And I asked that same question. And it was like, no, they know they couldn't give me any yeah. area where someone could go. So I encourage you to contact the SES as we yes, know. But housing yesterday, we're not here tonight. Yeah, but how many people do we have to ring when we're in a crisis? I mean, we get on the phone and you're stuck on a phone for 45 mm -hmm. minutes and no one can give you an answer. You make the statement standing up there saying you need to ring the right people. Well, we are ringing the right people, but these people don't know, and they'll pass it on to another number. And then we're stuck, I don't have time for that. We're trying to friggin' a big caravan park out. And yet, 45 minutes here, 30 minutes here, in the end, you've got to go, oh, stop this, I can't waste another bloody five minutes on a phone. All we need is just some answer, or someone that can answer, but instead, you're getting passed. To all these different numbers. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's true. It's so true, you know. Like you said, you know, make sure you're ringing the right services. Well, we are ringing the right services. Um, don't get me wrong, I know half of them are probably volunteers that are trying to help us. But at least somebody should have the decency to call us back. Here's my name, here's my phone number. I'm at the Blanchard Caravan Park. Call me back.
anybody anywhere at the moment. So they said they were trying to source places, but there was nothing available. Well, that makes them in the um, is he, has, can we, can we um, just, things have changed since then. The Premier did announce um, quite a substantial emergency accommodation package. If that man, if that gentleman still is homeless, um, I, I can't, I don't have Housing SA's direct number or anything like that, but I'm happy to talk to you and we will get you in touch with the right person from housing and they do have emergency accommodation. They, there is now um, motel accommodation that is that has been booked along the river corridor for emergency situations. So please, I, I, it's not my area, but there's no way I want someone in my community to still be in this situation, okay? So um, please, I'll, I'm happy to take that one on board with you. I, it's no, no. It's changed. No, no, no. It's changed. There has been changes because people worked out um, that the, the the original situation that was put in place wasn't going to actually meet the needs. So there is additional accom accommodation that has been provided, and there are a number of rooms along the river corridor that are permanently now held for that emergency accommodation. So there are now rooms available, more rooms than what were. I can't guarantee that there are lots of rooms, but there definitely is more rooms than what there was. So uh, we'll find a housing person to talk to you about that, especially about that gentleman. Okay. Thank you. I'd just like to say, uh, uh, I'd like to back the gentleman up there with the way SA Power treated us. Uh, last week, my wife and I, we're both 90 years old, and live in a house 60 metres up from the water's edge. We have a domestic pump. We're, we're not fortunate enough to be on town supply. Without any notice on our mobile phones, no, no text messages, no nothing, they turned up at our door with a ladder and pulled the fuse out of the pole, which is up there, and there's still at least nearly a metre and a half before the water's down there, and left us without water. Who's going to run our toilets and showers? Do they expect this lady with her trolley to go down with a bucket to the river? They, they never even, if they'd have given us notice. Since then, of course, I've been to Wakery and, and, and you can buy diesel pumps and that sort of thing to connect in. But we could have at least had the sense to give us some warning that this was going to happen. And I'm just really rotten on CSA power for that. My real question is to the lady from ENWS. Now, I went through the 1939 floods and all those ever since, because I've lived in this area all my life. Uh, now, since the 1956 flood level, where we've all got water levels marked, they've built the Blanchdown Bridge. And they put a causeway across the flat where that water went this deep all across that lagoon. The gentleman was more or less talking about this before. Now, all that water has to come through under the bridge. And then it meets the structures, the concrete structures of the lock. So how much is that going to affect us upstream? We live upstream from the lock, from the, from the bridge. How much is that going to make an increase when the, the high level gets here of the water upstream of this plunge down bridge? Somebody said there's a, a, a big pipe valve underneath there, but it's never been turned on as far as I know, in the middle of the causeway. Never been turned on as far as I know. It was actually to run the, keep the, uh, uh, the gum trees going down on the, on the river flat down there. But, but I, I really don't know too much about it. Uh, it's just <laughs> when they built the causeway. Uh, and, and that causeway is going to affect us upriver. Now, there's some quite close vineyards and, and people who are using domestic water, waters. Well, we're all on domestic water over there. We've got our own little pumps. Uh, how much is that? flow going to be higher than 56 flood when they talk about it could be a 56 flood. Thank you. Um, so thank you. That's a really good question. Um, and when I was speaking to you before, I mentioned that um, over time, since the 1974 flood, um, and 
since the 1950s flood, you know, things have changed. So, you know, there's levees, there, there's been bridges, um, vegetation has, um, you know, changed on the floodplain. Um, you know, the river itself has changed in nature, in depth, in width. Um, we're seeing it change now. Water is flowing where it wasn't flowing in 1956 or in 1974. Um, we are fortunate enough to have, um, you know, readings um, and modelling that we've been able to calibrate, you know, using that information that we have from those previous floods that does take into consideration infrastructure um, and that provides us with best guess forecasting with the levels. So the levels and the difference and, and the, um, the impacts that bridges and causeways and, and things like that that have been built, um, most of those things are accounted for in our, in our modelling, to the best of our knowledge. Um, but like I said before, you know, they're based on different flood events um, and water behaves very differently in different flood events. So um, in, the, in the weekly flow report, um, we do publish a table and it does show river heights um, and, you know, you can work the difference out, you know, in the river height that's predicted to be, fore or, you know, the forecast river height. Um, you know, we, we put down what the normal pool level is and then what the anticipated level will be. So you can work the difference out by taking one away from the other. Um, so that's the best I can do to answer your question tonight. If you want to have more of a conversation later on, you're more than welcome to. The gentleman Paisley, you showed up one day, Edson turned the power off. There were 34 homes in, the, in my little area. They turned off power to 32. Two started power. A week before they needed to. No warnings, no nothing. You guys are pretty good when you've got maintenance to do. You're pretty quick to put out a warning on our phones to everybody saying, you're not gonna have power because we're changing the transformer or whatever. You did bugger over this time. The guy just showed up, pulled the fuses. That was before the weekend. The weekend come up, everybody showed up, to, knowing there's a flood, we're gonna tidy up. The fridges are full of bloody food, they're all rotten. There was no real collection point to pick up any debris or any dead food. My wife spent a good hour on the phone chasing up the council to do a double pickup of all the bins because of SE Powers also. You need to get better, really better. The water now is just starting to breach on the road. We've been out of power now for about nine, 10 days. There was no reason to shut it down in that farm, in that manner, at that time. Yeah. Uh, look, I really and understand I, that. I can hear. I can yeah, hear. I'm sorry. You're not living here. No. You're not living with all this. Now, these guys are telling me, and when I hear all the stories, we've been planning this for months. Well, you're pretty short in your planning. You're short in your planning for several things. Where's all the rubbish going to go? Half of these shacks have got like, you no, know, fuel. Petal paints. Nobody showed up to say we'll do a collection and pick all that up. It's all going to end up in the river. Your power's a pain in the butt. AGL or whatever your, your, your supplier is, is responsible for the meters. I haven't seen a soul down looking at taking the meters off. Now you're talking that I've got to get a COC for my house before I can get power connected back on. Terrific. I've got to get a bloody meter first before I can even do that. And that's going to take forever. I would have thought somebody would have come up with a plan. If you've been working on this since July, August, September, somebody would have a list of things that had to be done and communicated to everybody. There's been no communication. My council's not here. Mid Murray's here. But my council's not here. Never showed its face up. So here on the Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sitting in the background. It's, quite frankly, um, for all your planning, boys, you need to do a downside there. Oh, by the way, what's going to happen to all this rubbish that's going to pile into this river? No? What actually happens with the meat box, the meters? 
Uh, the meters, it'll depend who, who's installed your meter. This is one of the complications of the, well, the rules. Well, 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 the old yeah, so we, 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 would attend, we would attend to your meter, the old meter, and what we've said we will do to reconnect, we will bypass the meter so that we can reconnect you. As soon as we can reconnect you, we will. Whether or not the retailer is going to provide their metering coordinator to be there, we will just bypass it because we understand you want to get your power on as soon as you can. J j uh, I, look, I, 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 hear the, I hear the room. Um, that's, we've, and we've heard those complaints about the notifications. And look, some of the notifications weren't good. They weren't. And uh, well, as I say, some of those were about whether or not we had communicated with, with the two people or whatever, and we've changed that to try and give people more notice, and we've also bringing it forward. So unfortunately, you have been the, the first people in the ranks, and we're, we're learning as we're going through it, and I think we'll see a lot of improvement in that from now, but I, I know that doesn't comfort you. No, I understand that. When we do, well, we did, well, no, that's that's been more of an evolving thing over the past eight to twelve weeks. But look, when we plan a planned work, that might be six months in the planning. Uh, we, we to do all the the planning and design and and organising the uh, resources. In this case, we're actually responding to emergency. An, an emergency and dealing with a, a, a vast number of people and uh, properties and connections across the river land. Not just here, but right, uh, right along the river, because it's not, it's not like a bow wave that's just coming down the river and affecting this. It's actually, as we've seen, been affecting floodplains down here and floodplains up, up further, etc. The, the crew. We hope that they knew yeah. before that. Yeah. So we got the text yeah. message at nine o'clock. It was gone by ten. Now you yeah. can't tell me that yeah. they didn't know no. until nine o'clock. No, and that, that's not no, and that's not good enough. Uh, and oh. and the crew, but the crew wouldn't go there knowing. They would assume that you you had been notified. So it's not it's not the crew. As I say, it's it's, it's the process. It's it's the process, and we have made changes to the process to make sure you you would get that message earlier. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's right. We were told that um, SA Power Networks had advised the council that it was going to be the 7th of December. Then the council was caught out. And that you were going, the council was going to arrange to empty uh, septic tanks or something like that. Yeah. Um, other, I have another question, sorry. I just don't understand why the community hub was cut off from power. So the community, community hub, we have quite a few um, things that we do during the week that we're now not able to do because there's no power. But the water is like, what, 100 metres down the road? Mm. We just don't understand why. Yeah, it's Can I take that on notice and follow it up for you? Well, Can you? Well, you well, over across the road at the Lot Master's Cottage, straight across from Julie and Bridge, or get some temporary power into that establishment so that at least the community's got somewhere to go. Well, the other option may be a generator. We actually made a proposal to SA Power Networks on Monday when we all arrived for our function and there was no power. And SA Power Networks said, well, we're not going to be able to do that because we've got power cuts and 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 we have 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 Yes. Can we can we catch up sure. after the question? I'll get your details. Okay. Yeah. Um, you did mention about waste. Yeah. Well, uh, I didn't hear anybody from any council yet. So is this? Ah, uh, no. Hang on. Can I go? Can we go back to the first? waste question, sorry. I just want to clear up one at a time so that the rubbish. So you were talking about two types of rubbish, your, your domestic rubbish and rubbish that's flowing in the river, or? Yeah, domestic rubbish is fine. We've changed yeah. that up and we've managed to get that sort of rubbish. Okay, so it's the, it's the river. 
So can I just let you know that from a, um, and once again, this is not the, my area, but the conversations that I've, I've heard, um, waste is being activated. That, so Green Industries SA will be the agency that will be looking after waste and, it, and in the very near future they will be coming on board to look at river cleanup. Um, so uh, that will happen. So if there... The water in my place is about one day over coming over the road. The minute it comes over the road, basically where I live, there's going to be a heap and nine feet in water. Yeah. Okay. Including the caravan park. There is going to be nothing you can do. So how much rubbish is actually there now? I don't know, but, but nobody's come up with an idea. Yeah. How we had, we had every every shack, every every house in this area would have paint, thinners, fuel of some description, plus loose timber, plus bits, because you can't afford to drive 100 clicks every time you want to get some. So every place here, down on the river, would have accumulation. That should have been thought of. And so this is say, from the council, you guys, and my. So this is all pays. This is all Paisley. We're talking about. Yeah, no, no. But each pe This is sorry. One of the challenges that we've had, and and I do live on. I live less than fifty five k's away. So and I am on the water. I am watching it come up every day. Okay, so I am part of seeing what everybody else is seeing. Each section, whether it be 10 k's away or 2 k's away, each section or community has its own unique issues and we need to come together as a community to identify them, create a common voice and then we can help facilitate what's missing because quite often there's so many other things going on that, that it's, I'm not defending anybody but there's so much going on that the, the, the things that are unique to your community may be missed. And so what I'm asking is that if we can come together as a small sub-communities, look at what needs to be done, and then I'm... Look, like I said, a lot of this is outside of my role, but I live here, so I am happy to work with whoever in smaller groups to try and get through to the bottom of these issues, because if these issues aren't resolved, we've got bigger problems later on. Okay, so I would like to sort them out now rather than later. So I'm happy to do that with you guys. No, we've got to not... Look, can I just say that we can't... We can't we can't always learn from things that are a long time ago because a lot changes. Okay, so well, but what I'm asking, okay, I'm I'm giving you a solution. Okay, I'm giving you a solution. I'm happy. Well, it might not be too late. We might still be able to actually. I, I don't know, but okay. Well, you know what, I, I would prefer to have a go. I would prefer to have a go than give up, OK? I'm not giving up. I just don't have suggestions. I mean, in other places, not particularly our area. Maybe you want to. We can do something where they keep clean out of our rubbish bins and put down. Yeah, so people can see what they can do. Yeah, yeah. Well, 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 yeah. Oh, for the last two weeks I've been going around and hearing some of these stories and wherever possible I've been trying to make some changes for you. I think right at, right at the front what you've pointed out are uh, things that we didn't quite get right and we apologise for that. What we're trying to do is wherever possible actively correct them as quickly as possible and I know uh, as you pointed out Terry we've, we've basically run out of time for some of those things. But it, we are continually learning and we're continually enhancing. And I, I really hope that from all the speakers that you've heard now, there's an absolute commitment to firstly protect life and secondly to protect property. We are... Sorry? Protect wildlife. Sorry? Protecting wildlife. We've got a river. Yep. There's a living order. And, and Terry, part, part of that recovery program is about the, the wildlife. We are facing a natural event that we cannot control yeah, and so what we're doing is every agency here, every representative is trying to do their level best and we're hearing what you're saying and we're trying to make amends uh, and, and fix those issues as best we can. So what you need to do is to 
to accept that we are here to speak with you to try to understand where, where some of those issues are, but also to give you an understanding of the thought processes and the process that we as agencies have engaged in. So we are here to assist you all. My job is to coordinate the recovery, which is a big, big uh, issue. It's a massive job. But I will need your help, everyone here, your help to inform me, inform all the agencies that I'll be working with about what needs to be done to help you. So, sorry. Yeah. But people that live down that way are going to get the flood that we've got here because yes. it's going that way. Yes. We've got family that live all down there. Yeah. And I hate the things. And, <laughs> and right. um, Crouching put out a statement to, to the newspapers and all those sort of papers that those people who are living on shacks and that further down get a truck now. Now, today, even though the water's not there, get a truck and throw all this stuff that's in their backyards and sheds and what into this truck and get rid of it now before yeah. it goes into the yeah. And look, on, on that issue, that's something that we'll look at to make sure it isn't too late for some of those, because if you go further down the river, the inundation's already occurring. So, and, and, and it's unfortunate uh, that we're at that point, and we can't say anything, but if we've missed that, then we've missed it. But what we're going to do is try to make, uh, to repair any damage that could have been, uh, could have arisen from this. So really, I think, what we need to do is to work collectively. We take everything that you say on notice and we look at how our systems can improve. And Paul from um, SAPN is listening to some of the instances and the reflections about what could have been done better. And as you heard, things have changed since that because as you pointed out, Terry, the, the power went out weeks ago. Well, there's been a lot of changes in the system since that time. Yeah, <laughs> but look, like I say, it, it is about safety of life, safety of property, and then we're looking at how we can do it better. And we'll take your, all your feedback, but some of that stuff, can't, we can't go back in time to do it a bit different. Could I keep raising on the 11th, on the 11th of November, I yeah. keep raising it, because obviously I have a son that's deep fed, mm. um, but gracefully, because we did a big upgrade, we were lucky to have our power on longer at the time. Yeah. As you know, Carol, I'm, in my you know, discussions with you guys, I do my level best to fix things that I can. And I can tell you now that each of the agencies is keen to listen and to change things if, they're po if it's possible. I wasn't at that meeting, so I have no control over what happened uh, with any information that was collected. But certainly, look, I think that we hear you loud and clear that things could have been done better. And what we want to do is to make sure that everybody here has a voice, has access to me and uh, the subsequent rec recovery to make sure that we're listening to what you, you are saying. And I will make sure that this community has a voice in that recovery program. That's what you need to be assured of now. Because the water's unfortunately already inundated and you can see the shacks and the caravan park uh, has already, un, you know, been inundated in Paisley Island. But did they know, like, is it, as in an honest, this is an honest answer to me, it's an honest question. Yeah. Before the 11th of November, yeah. because we were all told that the water was going to be there, yeah. and they were going to be there, 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 and they were going to be there
up there, right? Oh no, we, how many times were we told, no, 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 it's not going to exceed this level. Your roads built to the 1974 level. No, it's not going to get to the 1974 level. We all rock up here on the 11th of November. We all come in. It's announced. This is where the possibility, possibility is. Mm. It went 200, 220, a possibility of 250. Everyone just gasped. Yeah. Everyone just did this. Just, <gasps> yeah. Because by saying that, a month is not enough time. Yeah. That, that's what we're saying. So... I mean, in my gut feeling, my gut feeling is that somewhere down that track, someone knew along months before. Did you not say before someone was mapping in August? Look, I, I think that even uh, the representatives, uh, as you've heard, it's speculation. There are so many things that uh, need to be taken into account, and if they weren't, then uh, we're resulted in the position that we're in at the moment. And so what, what we're looking at doing is to understand that it was speculative based on best information that we could get at the time and we're tr continuing to try to refine that. I can't speak for the people who made those comments initially, but again, uh, on behalf of everybody here, we are trying to do our level best within the information, the data available to us. It's not like we're making you guys suffer intentionally. You know that. You know that we're here to help you. No, I know that. It's, it's a... Yeah. Well, when this all started, it's put out there, the power station Renmark. They built it on a, a mound or something. Yeah. Like 250 gigawatt litres of water. Mm -hmm. And the sand banging around. And we're told we're only getting 195. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I, I think that what you need to understand is that when when we consider something as critical infrastructure, we need to take that protection exceptionally seriously because there is still a chance, even though it's a remote chance, it's critical, and so we need to protect it. We need to defend it because that has that will have a longer lasting impact on you folk as well as my recovery. So I, we cannot afford to lose some of these things, so we need to allow for the unexpected. Yeah, I and just, I just it, like they knew that No, no, it, it's not for that purpose. It's just to absolutely make sure that, because you've heard the slimmest chance it might be, and we don't want that slimmest chance to be underestimated and take out stuff that we need, that you people need, to continue living here. So look, I, I think that we hear you loud and clear. We're all going to be here uh, to listen to you, to take down notes, and I'd hope that the people who have I've had a chance to speak to know that I'll do my level best to make good what I say I will do. So when is it due, like this peak thing? Yeah. So when are we due to peak, and are we having another peak, another? Like all right. And then how yeah. roughly, how long are we expected yeah. the water to be sitting in our properties? Okay. Like, are we talking months? No. Yeah. That's all right, Carol. Yeah. Um, that is also a very, very good question, and that is one that we've been getting quite a lot. Um, initially, um, remember when I was saying that as the water gets closer to the South Australian border, as the peak gets closer, we can start to refine our estimates and start to get better with our forecast, our dates um, and our ranges. So now that the water is moved through the system and it's getting closer to the South Australian border, we're getting a better feel for what we expect to arrive at the border. And does that account for you entering that question? No, please go on. Does that account for all the Yep. That obviously, once you get it there at that point at the border, but what is it creating downstream? Like, how, how are they accounting all that water now that can't be dispersed in those areas? Yeah. Um, so, the modelling that we have doesn't account for those levees that have been built in the past couple of weeks. Um, but what we have done is, because we have 
you know, our attention has been drawn to the fact that some of our gauges haven't been reading correctly because there is so much water that it is now bypassing the gauges. So, you know, for example, you know, at one point where the river may have been, you know, 150, 200 metres wide, it's now six kilometres. Um, so what we've done um, is we've got hydrographers out on the ground reading those gauges and verifying so that we can have a better understanding as we're providing these forecasts to you. Um, you know, we are talking about a peak um, that will be arriving at the border um, and it will be arriving around Boxing Day um, and then working its way through the system. Um, how long that peak will stay, we still don't know enough to provide you with, you know, a, a tangible but amount of time. Yeah. Yep. But my understanding is, only hearing by locals and that, that when it gets to Renmark, and mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, generally it takes six weeks for that water from Renmark to get to here. No. No. So no, it doesn't. How long does it take? If you give me a second. It takes 15 days for the water to get to Morgan. Big pardon? 15 days, roughly, yep. from the water to Morgan, and 17 to Manage. So That's correct. Yep. So the water, the water that we're getting now, this is the whole lot coming and then we're only going to have one peak on Boxing Day? Yeah, so I think the, the language around the two peaks, um, you know, can be confusing. We have seen that earlier on um, when we were talking to the community and when we were talking about, you know, providing our forecast, we were saying that, you know, the water levels would rise and then they'd start to flatten out before they start to rise again. So they rose, um, and I think they, they rose, I think it may have been either Wednesday or Thursday last week. And now what we're starting to observe is them flattening out before they rise again. Yes, yeah. they, they, they are still, yeah, they will still be rising. They're not going to dip by a, a considerable amount, but they have dipped ever so slightly. Um, so, at the border, yeah, at the border. So remember, um, you know, that's the thing. So we're talking about flow at the border. It's important to remember um, that also as it works its way down, it's going to attenuate and, you know, it's going to, to go out over floodplains and, um, you know, over tributaries that may not have been there over the past 50 years. Um, levees, roads, bridges. I mean, I don't need to tell you, you're local. You know what has been built since, you know, since 1974, things like that, things that have changed. Um, you wouldn't really make money off, and you put a, a metre of water over Lake Bunny, we'd have to get a lot of water, it's a big area, and that's all going to come down on us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like like Lake Bunny. yeah I'm not too sure about Lake Bunny, I can't really answer any questions about Lake Bonnie, but I can take a question and, and get it looked into. Um, but yeah, you know, it's a, it's a tough thing to forecast and we're doing our best um, with the information that we have and with what we know is um, changing in the environment and, and, and out and around. Um, but yeah, with your question about, you know, how long this water is going to hang around for and how long it's going to take to recede, we still don't have enough information to be able to make a call at this time. But as soon as we do, we will let you know. That is the one thing that we are doing. Um, the Department for Environment and Water is absolutely forecasting. As soon as we know, we are letting you know. So it's going to peak in Renmark, which date did you say? Again, that's 20 Yeah, so... <laughs> So the current, the Let me current get a correct. From the flow report that went out today, from yep. the EW, I'll tell you where you're finding notes, is uh, in uh, Lock 1, the current pool level is 5.68 metres. It is. Metres, it is. Uh, and it's rising at the projection of 180 gigalitres to around 7.07 .07 metres. Yep. And that's framed between January 5 and 16. That's the current level. That's when it gets to Lock 1. Yeah, just yeah, to, Lock 1. Yep. That's the current modelling, but obviously there's variables that are going to change. If you want to, you can come and see me later. I've got it on the table. That's all right. Thanks, Fiona. Sorry. I'm very conscious that we've kept you here longer than what we're anticipating. Was there any questions from online, Mel? Nothing online? I have one final question. Yep. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, 
Can the can the walk one start to now hike and pull the through the weekend? Please? Yeah, sorry. Because all we're getting is it comes in Friday morning and it's Monday afternoon before you get the next one. Yeah. It would be helpful for those that are here to know exactly what's coming and what what's dropping or whatever. Yeah, so with the lock one levels, that information is, is available online. Um, we have uh, data that is logged against that lock. Um, you can come and see me, I can tell you where it is, but it's all available on that sa.gov.au website. Days Seven days a week, yeah. Because the best I can find is five days yep. until recently. Yeah, I think it's even on the SA Water website. Yes. Yep. Yep. No worries. Okay. Um, thank you for the, those questions. If you've got any questions, we've heard about the post-it notes, etc. There's some paper at the end. If you want to put some questions up there, we will pass them back to the agencies. And um, we really want to know what questions you've got and put them up there if you have some. I'd just like to thank the speakers who have been here tonight. So we've had Robert, Joe, Ben, Tony, Barbara and Paul. Um, we also have some other people in the audience. We've got someone here from SAPOL. Uh, so you're welcome to hang around if a bit long while we pack up. So if you've got some more questions to speak to them, if you want to like, would you like to? Um, we've talked a lot about things that you can do, but would also remind you to think about your mental health. So speak to your GP if you're concerned or anxious about any things that are happening. We've got lots of brochures. We've got lots of information. This meeting has been live streamed and it will also be saved on the SASES website. So if you want to go back and have a look at any time, you're welcome to do that. All the meetings have been saved on the SASES website. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. It's important um, for people to let you, to let, sorry, Morton, I'm sorry. It's important to us to know that people are getting the, doing the right thing and wanting to take actions to keep themselves safe. And we're all working to keep you safe and thank you for starting your preparation to get ready to. So there'll be a few speakers here if you'd like to speak to them and thank you very much.